Next up, we're going to look at the corporate strategy and how that is being challenged and what is happening and what is happening with marketing within that corporate strategy. So we're going to give you some attitude. It's going to be a real punchy session um, to help lead that session. And our moderator is Wenda Harris-Millard, who is the Vice Chairman of MediaLink. Please come to the stage, Wenda. <laughs> Woo, let's go. Well, thank you, Jeremy, and good morning, everybody. Uh, it's quite fitting, uh, I think, that I'm here today with my good friend, Kim Cadillac. Kim is the Senior Vice President uh, of Visa's Global Marketing Platforms. Uh, and we're going to talk about the influence uh, that marketers have uh, on business strategy and success. Kim has a remarkable resume that includes senior leadership positions at agencies, media companies, and at brand marketers. She's a seasoned executive. She's contributed to the success of some of the world's most powerful brands, including Coca-Cola, Johnson & Johnson, NBCU, and 21st Century Fox among them. In today's disruptive and disrupted environment, where communication is transacted in the time it takes to type a tweet, transformation is a requirement. Every day brings a new platform to leverage, a new device to master, and a new data stream to tame. Marketing experts like Kim are on the front line of that effort, tackling the challenges in real time, mastering new technology, and exploring and delivering on the wants and needs of consumers. Given the role that marketers play, one would think that the C-suites and boardrooms of the corporate world would be teeming with marketing leaders. They're not. Only 4% of corporate directors consider marketing an important function for a board member, 4%. CMO tenure has decreased to an average of just over four years. And fewer than 50 of the 9,800 board members of Fortune 1000 companies are occupied by marketers. 50 of the 9,800. That's less than half of 1%. So, what is the root cause of this curious discrepancy? I'm very excited to dig in on that subject uh, with an industry leader who appears to be uh, defying uh, that trajectory. So Kim, come on up and we'll have a chat. Hi. So let's get right to the point. Okay. Um, from a, from a broad-based industry standpoint, why do you think there is so much pressure on marketing and yet seemingly less appreciation for that function than there should be in, in the C-suite and, and at the board level? So let me ask you, do you think marketing is undervalued? I do. I mean, I, I think it has a, a, an uphill battle already, as it is, because if you think about marketing as a function, since the beginning, it's looked at as an expense or overhead, right? And there's the old adage about we know that 50% of our advertising is working, we just don't know which 50%. Um, so it's really difficult to come up with hard enough metrics to convince board members in C-suite sometimes, and that's been the history. And then pile on top of that, which is something that I kind of am seeing as almost change fatigue, um, it is changing so quickly. Um, data and technology is changing the game and layering a lot of complexity onto what the marketing picture looks like. Yeah. Um, and it's, it becomes difficult to translate that into a C-suite language. Um, and, and I think that it's made it more difficult to, to really educate on why it's so important and how it, it does add value. Um, but on, on the positive side, um, I think that our metrics are getting stronger. We're able to be way more precise, and we're able to actually start to measure the exact value that marketing and advertising brings to the bottom line and how we can connect advertising impressions to actual transactions for Visa. So we've made tremendous strides, and, and people are starting to pay attention to that. Um, we're also better able to know our customer and understand their behaviors and understand how to flip that 80-20 model mm -hmm. that we're so used to playing with into more of like a 550 model. Like I, we can understand with precision what 5% is really driving a big portion of our business. 
So transformation like that, I think, is making marketing have a much bigger strategic seat at the table. But it, it takes a lot of um, work to, to get there, I think, still. Well, it's, you know, so it kind of sounds like we need to market marketing or yeah. maybe rebrand marketing. And yeah. um, I want to talk about that a, a little bit later. But what you were just talking about in terms of um, data and science and, you know, marketing, I think, years and years ago, really before the advent of, of technology in our, in our business, it used to be more about instinct and, you know, gut and, and, and vision. But with so much data being fired off by consumers every, every single minute, um, the discipline certainly seems to be as much science uh, as, it, as it is art. And I think you're, you're saying that you agree with that. Yeah, I think it's a fine balance. I think that the, the data and technology stream is definitely, it's changing the game. And as an industry, we kind of come to the table saying it's disruptive. Um, but really, when you think about it, it's actually a gift if, if you know what to do with it. And I, I think that you know, with companies like Uber and Amazon, we've almost gotten to a point in marketing mm -hmm. where creating magic is a cost of entry. It's just that's where you have to start, which makes it way more challenging. Um, but on the other hand, you think about you know, 80% of the data out there is unstructured and basically unusable. So we need really smart brains mm -hmm. to be able to interpret what we do with that. And to fuel creativity, you need yeah. that talent and those brains to start to decipher what the data actually means. And, and I think you know, we, we had an expression, I guess, about three years ago when uh, big data uh, came into our lives and you know, data is the new black. And I always thought that was wrong. It's, it's not the data, it's the derivative of the data it's the consumer consumer insight. But I, I want to go back to this um, art and science a, a, a minute, because you, you referenced the old quote about half my advertising works. I just don't know which half. So as a very contemporary marketer, how do you balance the, the art and the science? Um, it's not all science. No. There's still vision and some gut. And so how do you balance that? Well, there's a lot of people involved. I think <laughs> yeah. it takes a lot of different skill sets that um, maybe we're not so comfortable with yet, but that we're working on. I, I think, you know, fearless collaboration comes to mind. Um, I, I'm living in a world now where we're kind of pooling together our technology specialists, our engineers, our IT people, our marketers, our product people in the same room to identify common priorities. And I think that, you know, being able to translate all of those different languages into one common set of priorities is a big deal and can be very transformational. So I think it, it, it requires, it does require that. Um, does, I th that, does that mean that you need, from a talent perspective, the skill sets required then to be successful um, as a marketer, uh, and, and certainly in, in other areas as well, but the skill set has really changed yeah. Uh, I would say dramatically. I, do you agree with that? Or? Yeah. yeah. I, I think we've, we're moving into a world where it's going to be increasingly important to be able to lead in the zone of influence, right, versus a, running a PL, um, which is very clear cut. And there's still mm -hmm. power in that. And there's that kind of healthy tension between PL holders and people who have to lead and influence across functions and across enterprises. But that, I think, is going to be a really key. Um, skill set and talent. I also think you, ha you, you need to have the courage to start to poke and break things with, a, with an optimistic expectation that better things will come from it. Um, and also have what I call kind of that brave heart moment of we're moving really fast and we're really busy and that's all looking really good except that maybe we need to take a beat here and hold and determine whether we're doing the right thing or if we're running too fast in the wrong direction. And I think that is very difficult with teams, especially when you're dealing with roadmaps and pipelines and timetables and quarterly targets. Um, taking that moment to reassess, I think, is critically important because um, I think you can miss things. That reminds me of a, a phrase that I think is, is gone from our lexicon. Uh, and that phrase was, well, 
let, let me sleep on that. <laughs> First of all, who sleeps? Yeah, no Item sleeping. one. Item two, do you ever hear anybody say that anymore? No. Let me sleep on that? No, let me respond to you right away because yeah. I have 75 other things. Uh -huh. Yeah, it, it's kind of interesting. Right. So, so you've had so much experience. You, you really kind of have the, the troika here. Um, with brand marketing experience, agency experience, media company experience, how do you how do you think that prepares a marketing executive like you, very senior level, large company? Um, talk for a minute about the the unique perspective uh, that you bring, and, and I also I, I want to get back to this board issue. Um, with your background, what, what unique perspective do you bring to the highest levels of a company like yours? Uh, and, and what could you bring to a board? Yeah, I think that um, the more you cross train, whether you change companies or really build yourself a very stringent learning agenda, the more open you are <laughs> to change and to the feeling of never being done. Um, because that's kind of the world we live in. It's never really done. It's not closed loop at all. Um, and I, I think it, it opens you up to being, I believe, a much more um, sensitive leader and partner um, because you understand a lot of different sides of the business and the pain points and the competing agendas and the value of competing agendas um, for better outcomes. And so I think it's critically important. And even if you stay at a company for your entire career, I really do think you have to be very deliberate about making sure you're learning new things and making sure you're looking outside of your company um, and interacting with people from other industries or even people in your industry. Attending conferences like this. Yes, I know of course. what's going on. What are people of course. thinking? Because you know, if you get too insular, um, you can't contribute. Um, and so I think all of those things have helped me along the way, for sure. So I think, let me interpret a, a little bit. Um, because as you know, I've been doing uh, a lot of work on this issue uh, of diversity on boards, but with a focus also on diversity of, of skill set. Mm -hmm. And that number is startling, less than half a, a percent. Um, of Fortune 1000 board members have marketing backgrounds. But I think what you're talking about is not just marketing. It's much broader based business experience. Mm -hmm. And some of the, the work that I've been, been doing and the research um, shows that one, one of the uh, holdbacks for marketers on boards is the perception that they aren't broad based business People. Yeah, but it, it sounds like what you're doing is that broad-based business. So we're going to get back in a second to that question. Okay. Of, does that mean that we need to remarket marketing? Yeah. Uh, but one of the things I wanted to ask you, I want to talk to you about what you do at Visa specifically. But I think one of the very interesting things about your company is you seem to have a lot of. This is just my perception. A lot of support for marketing. Mm -hmm. Um, your CFO comes from Pepsi. Mm -hmm. You have several board members who have backgrounds in marketing, sales, information technology. Is this, are you finding a, a more supportive environment at Visa than other marketers might in other, other companies? Yeah, I, I think so. I think it does help when you have you know, C-suite and board members that have a broader base of knowledge and, and that touches consumer marketing and also B&B marketing, um, it's helpful. And I would say at Visa that marketing has a very serious seat at the table, um, not only from a communications perspective, for, but from a strategic business perspective. But that makes us very much on the hook for connecting what we do to actually business outcomes and to the overall strategies of the CEO, um, because that is the language they're listening for. They are listening for yeah. how do we protect, protect uh, shareholder value? How do we build our business? Um, and, and we're able to do that more and more every day. I think it also spurs um, a lot, a, a much more open environment and much healthier environment around debate because there are so mm -hmm. many different backgrounds coming together that I've been in a lot of really heated meetings, even in my short time so far. Um, and I came out a little shell-shocked 
and wondered kind of what the aftermath would be. And the aftermath was kind of awesome. Like everybody was still amazingly supportive and okay with the fact that we disagreed. Um, and so that felt really good. I think it spurs innovation. I think it is spurring already some incredible partnerships that we're doing that you wouldn't expect with Honda um, around uh, cars and commerce and, and with IBM and Watson around enabling uh, payment services on like 30 billion mobile devices by 2020. So there's some amazing thing happening and we're opening um, innovation centers all over the world and, and those agendas are all coming from very different angles of the so, company. Like the diversity of skill sets, yeah. diversity of yeah. points of view, different different lenses. It's really it's yeah. interesting, yeah. I think it's a good a good environment. So what what exactly do you do? Um, <laughs> what what are global marketing platforms? So what <laughs> what areas of marketing are, are under your purview? Yeah, so it's, it's kind of a broad base. I mean, basically my mission is to help enable Visa become the most impactful and creative data-led marketer in the world. That is my mission. Um, and in order to do that, we're going to build some centers of excellence around data analytics, around agency and partner management, and around content. Um, and, and, you know, that includes a lot of different areas of the company that come together. Um, but that is what so, we're working on. So how do you organize that? I mean, that, that, that's no small ambition um, for you or for the company. And you talked before, I think you said fearless collaboration. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as I think about what marketing used to be, uh, a little softer, maybe a little fluffier and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, more advertising and promotion, than the marketing we know today. Mm -hmm. um, taking that, that ambition, how are you pulling this all together at this very, very large company? Can you talk a little bit more about the groupings and the, and the collaboration? Yeah, I mean, I, last week I had probably one of the best days of my career, and it's, it's illustrative of, of this kind of thought around pulling a large, diverse company together. We actually had a full day meeting with our IT department. Um, we meaning marketers? We, marketers, and, okay. our, our data, our ad tech, and our marketing technology folks, and our IT people. And we all came to the table with our uh, wish list for fiscal year 18 on what the priorities should be and what the investment should be and how we were going to allocate resources. And we had three super different agendas at the beginning of the day. Um, priorities were misaligned, um, all for good reasons. Everybody was well-intended, but no one had really connected dots. And so we spent eight, do eight hours connecting dots and translating marketing outcomes for IT professionals. And IT professionals were translating technology requirements for marketers. It was fantastic. It was fantastic because we left the room that day with an aligned set of priorities for, for next year. And um, I think it's the first time that's ever happened. And um, we've built bridges, and I, I felt really excited about that. So that's how you do it. It takes actually talking to people. It's kind of amazing. Not that. Yeah, not wow. that. In, in person. <laughs> That's very old-fashioned, Kim. <laughs> I know. It's kind of crazy. <laughs> How about it? Yikes, yikes. So I want to get back to, to this question of, of sort of assessing the meaning of marketing mm -hmm. in a contemporary environment. Mm -hmm. Do you think we need to market marketing, or do you think we need to, to rebrand it to get uh, marketers, you know, kind of higher up in that, in that food chain and then eventually to the board, and how, how do we do that? Yeah, I, I think it needs to be repositioned. I, I think that we have to take um, marketing out of the function and make it more of a business enabler, mm -hmm. right? A, a strategic business enabler. Um, if you are able to articulate the power behind the data that you're using, the understanding of the consumer that you have, which sounds cliche, but if you do it right, you really start to unearth some very valuable nuggets around how to connect. Um, and and I, I believe that if you reposition how you're translating that data, you can start to inform 
product pipeline development, uh, new revenue streams, uh, an acquisition strategy. You can start to articulate what areas of the company is driving more business and how to position communications behind that. So I, I think there's a lot of opportunity mm. there. Um, but I think it's a, a, a repositioning and also a coming to the table with a more holistic viewpoint that represents your colleagues in other functions. So it's not just a siloed marketing point of view. That, that, very interesting. But something also that you just said about consumer insight, um, if you take that uh, same Fortune 1000 companies, since 2003, they have increased the number of financial executives on their boards by 800%, 800%. So when you were talking just now about consumer insight, where's the consumer insight you know, at that board table um, if it's just populated by financial executives, lawyers, all of these things are necessary, but the marketer's voice isn't heard, and who else at that table has an understanding of the consumer? And this is one of the things that absolutely fascinates me uh, it about is a blind marketers spot. not at the table. It does seem to be a blind spot, but it isn't a blind spot if you consider what has happened recently where you know companies that have taken decades to build brand equity and brand trust have lost it in a tweet or a viral video. Or, or dragging a passenger off a plane, perhaps. Details, yeah. but yes, yes. So, so I think that is a striking example, and that's when boards and, and stock markets um, respond mm -hmm. to consumer behavior and insights and how important brand trust and brand equity is. Um, and, I think we have to use those examples to illustrate the power the of power. brand equity. I mean, I think it's intuitive, but it isn't on a financial statement. And so how do we start to articulate it? I think it's on us to do a better job of articulating the value. Well, and I don't think it's easy, but I, I think it's, we it's need It's not to do easy, it. but I, I feel better after this, this <laughs> conversation about our, our prospects. And Kim, I think there's, um, there's a reason um, that you're in this very senior position, and I do, I do believe um, that you will defy some of these uh, so. trends, and I think your intelligence and, and insight uh, and thought about this conversation will propel uh, more marketers on board. So thank you for those great thoughts. No, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Thanks.